Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. A large number of highly radioactive isotopes released by the destruction of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant grossly contaminated the Japanese mainland. Most of these radionuclides had short half-lives, which meant they would essentially disappear in a matter of days or months. For many of those who were exposed to them, there will be major health consequences. However, there are some radioactive elements that will not rapidly disappear, and it is, it is these long-lived radionuclides that will remain to negatively affect the health of all complex life forms that are exposed to them. Chief among them is cesium-137, which has taken on special significance because it's proven to be the most abundant of the long-lived radionuclides that has remained in the environment following the nuclear disasters at Chernobyl and Fukushima. It has a 30-year radioactive half-life, which is why it persists in the environment. Scientists now believe that it will be 180 to 320 years before the cesium-137 around the destroyed Chernobyl reactor actually disappears from the environment. Cesium is water-soluble and quickly makes its way into soils and waters. It is the same atomic family as potassium, and it mimics it, acting as a macronutrient. It quickly becomes ubiquitous in contaminated ecosystems. It is distributed by the catastrophic accidents at nuclear power plants because large quantities of volatile radioactive cesium build up inside the fuel rods of nuclear reactors. Thus, any accident at a nuclear reactor that causes the fuel rods to rupture, melt, or burn will cause the release of radioactive cesium gas. Long-lived radionuclides, such as cesium-137, are something new to us as a species. They did not exist on Earth in any appreciable quantities during the entire evolution of complex life. Although they, although they are invisible to our senses, they are millions of times more poisonous than most of the common poisons we are familiar with. They cause cancer, leukemia, genetic mutations, birth defects, malformations, and abortions at concentrations almost below human recognition and comprehension. They are lethal at the atomic or molecular level. They emit radiation, invisible forms of matter and energy that we might compare to fire, because radiation burns and destroys human tissue. But unlike the fire of fossil fuels, the nuclear fire that issues forth from radioactive elements cannot be extinguished. It is not a fire that can be scattered or suffocated, because it burns at the atomic level. It comes from the disintegration of single atoms. Thus, radioactivity is a term which indicates how many radioactive atoms are disintegrating in a time period. We measure the intensity of radioactivity by the rate of disintegrations and the energy they produce. One becquerel is equal to one atomic disintegration per second. One curie is defined as that amount of any radioactive material that will decay at a rate of 37 billion disintegrations per second. So one curie equals 37 billion becquerels. Sometimes these man-made radionuclides are compared to naturally occurring radionuclides, such as potassium-40, which is always found in bananas and other fruits. However, this is a false comparison, since naturally occurring radioactive elements are very weakly radioactive. In the charts from the labs that are in green up there, the radioactivity is described as a specific activity. Note that potassium-40 has a specific activity of 71 10 millionths of a curie per gram. Compare that to the 88 curies per gram for cesium-137. It's like comparing a stick of dynamite to an atomic bomb. Highly radioactive fission products such as cesium-137 and strontium-90 emit 10 to 20 million times more radiation per unit volume than does potassium-40. So which one of these would you rather have in your bananas? It is, in fact, the amount of cesium-137 deposited per square kilometer of land that defines the degree to which an area is classified as being too radioactive to work or live. One may get an idea of the extreme toxicity of cesium-137 by considering how little of it is required to make a large area of land uninhabitable. The lands that were grossly contaminated by the destruction of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant are classified by the number of curies of radiation per square kilometer. For 3,840 square miles of land contaminated with 15 to 40 curies of radiation per square kilometer, these lands are considered strict radiation dose control zones. The 1,100 square mile uninhabitable exclusion zone that surrounds a destroyed Chernobyl reactor has greater than 40 curies of radioactivity per square kilometer. For those more familiar with square miles, that would be 104 curies per square mile. Consider again that one gram of cesium-137 has 88 curies of radioactivity. 
Thus, as little as one-third of a gram of cesium-137 made into microparticles, distributed as a smoke or gas over an area of one square, square kilometer, will make that square kilometer uninhabitable. Less than two grams of cesium-137, a piece smaller than an American dime, if made into microparticles and evenly distributed over as a radioactive gas over an area of one square mile, will turn that square mile into an uninhabitable radioactive exclusion zone. Central Park in New York City can be made uninhabitable by two grams of microparticles of cesium-137. Hard to believe, isn't it? (laughs) Remember, these nuclear poisons are lethal at the atomic level. There are as many atoms in one gram of cesium-137 as there are grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. That's 10 to 21 atoms, 10 to the 21st power. 1,480 trillion of them, which is 10 to the 12th power, are disintegrating every second releasing invisible nuclear energy. So this works out to about one and a half million disintegrations per square meter. I included an extra slide to note the immense inventories of cesium-137, 150 million curies that are located in the nearby spent fuel pool at Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant, which is about 40 miles from here by road and less than that as the radioactive cloud flies. Many of the 104 U.S. uh, commercial nuclear reactors and power plants have more than 100 million curies of cesium-137 in their spent fuel pools. This is many times more than the spent pools at Fukushima. So now that we have some idea of the extreme toxicity of cesium-137, let's look at the extent of the contamination of the Japanese mainland. It's now known that the reactors 1, 2, and 3 at Fukushima Daiichi all melted down and melted through the seal reactor vessels within a few days following the earthquake and tsunami of March 11, 2011. This was not made public by either TEPCO or the Japanese government for two months. The greatest amounts of highly radioactive gases were released shortly after the meltdowns, and 80% of this gas released by the actors believed to have traveled away from Japan over the Pacific. However, the remaining 20% was dispersed over the Japanese mainland. On March 11th, the U.S. National Nuclear Security Administration offered the use of its NA-42 aerial measuring system to the Japanese and U.S. governments, the National Atmospheric Release Advisory Center of the Lawrence Livermore Lab stood up to provide atmospheric modeling projections. The next two slides were produced by Lawrence Livermore and were presumably given to the Japanese government. On March 14th, the easterly winds which had been blowing the highly radioactive gases and aerosols coming from Fukushima out to sea shifted and pushed the radioactive plume back over the Japanese mainland. You can see the progression. The, the red uh, indicates the radioactive plume. Note that the images indicate that the plume first went south over Tokyo, and then reversed and went north as the wind changed. All the areas where the radioactive gases passed were over were contaminated. However, the heaviest contamination occurred where rainfall uh, where it rained out. And this is, uh, accounts for the patchy deposition of the radioactive fallout. Eight months after the disaster, the Japanese Science Ministry released this map. That's the one with the, let's see, it would be on your right which shows that 11,580 square miles, which is 30,000 square kilometers, which represents 13% of the Japanese mainland, have been contaminated with long-lived radioactive cesium. Note that the official map does not note any cesium-137 contamination in the Tokyo metropolitan area, unlike an unofficial survey uh, done about the same time by Professor Yukio Hayakawa of Gunma University. Given the fact that the Japanese government and TEPCO denied for two months that any meltdowns that had occurred at Fukushima, one must look at all official data with a healthy degree of skepticism. 4,500 square miles, or earlier today we heard 7,700 square miles, uh, which is an area larger than the size of Connecticut, was found to have radiation levels that exceeded Japan's previously allowable exposure rate of one millisievert per year. Rather than evacuate this area, Japan chose to raise its acceptable radiation exposure rate by 20 times, from 1 millisievert to 20 millisieverts per year. However, approximately 300 square miles adjacent to the destroyed Fukushima reactors were so contaminated that they were declared uninhabitable. 159,000 Japanese were evicted from this radioactive exclusion zone, lost their homes, property, and businesses, and most have received only a small compensation to cover the cost of their living as evacuees. Note here that the criteria used for evacuation is a millisievert. It's not a measured quantity of radiation per unit area that I've described, such as the Curie or Becquerel. Rather, the sievert is a calculated uh, quantity. It's calculated to represent the biological effects of ionizing radiation. 